and I'll, I'll restart the, uh, the recording here. I am um, uh, posting um, these to the to the uh, site, so if you want to make use of those, you uh, can. Okay, so let's. Um, so this morning we talked about um, sensitivity analysis. Um, sensitivity analysis that involved testing sensitivity of model outcomes in, in some uh, in a variety of senses against assumptions in the model. <clears throat> some of these assumptions were structural. Some of the assumptions were quantitative. And it does, some involved parameters and others involved the particular vagaries of, of the stochastic that we're playing out in the model. Um, and we explored a number of types of sensitivity analysis, one way, two way, Monte Carlo, um, structural. Um, and I alluded to the fact that while we were looking at a fixed outcome, um, you know, often we're, we're interested in looking at multiple outcomes or, or results of scenarios. And often you can get a great deal of insight about, about sensitivity that matters by looking at scenario outcomes. But today, um, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about another topic, which at a mechanical level would seem to involve some overlapping issues. We're going to run for sensitive analysis. We ran the model many times. We ran it because of stochastics for many realizations, an ensemble of realizations. And then we ran it for different parameters. In this next process, calibration, we're, we're also going to be running it many times. But the goals, mechanics, the challenges, the opportunities are actually quite different between these areas. Um, and I'm going to try to lead you on a, on a, on a brief, brief tour of what's actually a very deep area. Um, and one that for agent-based modeling has some special opportunities and challenges associated with it. Um, so for calibration, um, we're going to be pursuing a different quarry. For sensitivity analysis, we were seeking to understand how model outcomes depended on our assumptions. For calibration, we're seeking to adjust our assumptions, most commonly about parameters, parameter value, but sometimes about the model structure itself to best and indeed adequately match model outcomes against empirical data. And in this slide, I happen to call it dealing with data gradients. And it's, it's, um, you know, not a satisfactory term to me, but the basic gist is something I mentioned this morning. To wit, when we're dealing with empirical data about a system, there are dribs and drabs of this data, bits of this data that relate to particular parameters in the system, particular you know, features of the system. Um, sometimes we can find some literature, the meta-analyses from from systematic reviews from, from particular primary data collection, lab experiments, trials. But often when we're dealing with a system that challenges us, we want to better manage it, we want to better control uh, the, the burden of, an, of, of a uh, chronic disease or, or prevent it. Often what we have in spades, often what we have more voluminous yet, is empirical data of observations from that system. And those observations from the system typically are not neatly cut up in a way that relates to only one parameter. They're emergent features of this system that very that motivates um, our wanting to, to, to work to improve the situation of the system, to understand it. When we're dealing with these complex systems, we often have many observations from different areas of the system, different quarters of the system. Maybe they're observations over time, maybe they're episodic you know, ob observations. 
maybe it's just expert knowledge gathered by some knowledge that rates are much higher in women than men or much higher in this vulnerable minority group than in the, the broader population or what have you. Um, we often have much knowledge uh, about the system that can't be reduced to any one parameter or any one assumption of model. It results from a tangled set of these different phenomena. You know, if you, if I give the example of COVID-19 cases this morning. Um, you know, it, it results from a, the number of COVID-19 cases we see is it results in a tangled way from how effective our case finding is, you know, how much transmission is occurring. And that, that itself depends on things like contacts and hygienic practices between people. It's reflective of the vaccination status of the population and many, many other factors. How many people are asymptomatic versus symptomatic, which is a function partly of age and people's, people's immunological status and, and many other factors. And, and so like, we can't take observation of cases and somehow reduce it and say, this observation of cases directly tells us this parameter or that parameter. It's this tangled combination. But it tells us something about the system of great significance. And calibration is all about taking advantage of those observations. It's all about going and leveraging our knowledge of the system in order to, in order to get clarity on what our assumptions need to be to better explain that data. And sometimes that knowledge is of parameter values, and sometimes it's of model structure. So sensitivity in some ways is starting with assumptions and asking if we vary them, what are the results? Um, if by contrast, calibration is finding the assumptions um, that will explain it or, or making sure our assumptions explain it, find the particulars of those assumptions that will best explain. So um, that's that's our core with calibration. Um, let's let's go on and, and this is a key process and a key nexus with agent-based modeling. And in agent-based modeling, the opportunities here and the challenges are both notable. Opportunities because in an agent-based model, as I've mentioned be before, we can. We have a, a model that in some sense is generating data that it can be every bit as fine grained as data we have from the world. Lineless data, individual level data, data on people's behavior over time or, or their experiences over time, data from different quarters of the system divided up in all different ways. And we can make use of that because we can leverage it from the agent-based model. We can total things up in different ways, slice and dice it as we want. We can compare it very readily against empirical data from the world of many sorts, including individual level observations, um, including over time, people's history, et cetera. And that's extremely powerful. We can look at disparities. We can look at differences between groups, heterogeneity over the landscape, all sorts of things. The power there is actually quite incredible. But at the same time, we have challenge. We have a model that's stochastic. And it can be a fool's errand to try to get it to accord by somehow changing parameter values to try to match every nook and cranny of observations over time. It's too much stochastics. Um, and it takes a long time to calibrate. And sometimes there are many parameters which we're dealing with, um, different, different areas of the system. These are some of the challenges that come up in calibration. Um, and, and so calibration is a, is a process of significance. It's a process with um, a great deal to make it important and to recommend it for age miss models, but also one that, that requires special attention.
And the philosophy I want to again articulate is that calibration is not just a mechanical turn the crank process that gets you parameter values that let you proceed to the next interesting stage of modeling, policy analysis or whatever, whatever it is, understanding the, the patterns you see in the population. It's not just something where we get out the goodies in the form of parameter values and move on. It's something that challenges our assumptions. And calibration will sometimes require, effective calibration, successful calibration, will sometimes require you to get out of your comfort zone and change your assumptions about the system. Sometimes it require you to change your assumptions about the form of structural assumptions. Sometimes change your assumptions about the values in which uh, parameters plausibly live. But at a deeper, and, and those are often the case. Many a time have I learned, you know, that my structure needs to be modified because of calibration. Many a time have I spotted as well data problems that don't come out until calibration. I could think of five or six times in my life where I have tried, thrown myself against the unforgiving walls of calibration, trying to calibrate a model, and it just does not calibrate properly. And I am wondering what is off in my mental model until I talk with the stakeholders who know this data intimately. And they smile knowingly and say, oh, yeah, um, that data is known to be problematic. Or, you know, oh, yeah, so you can't match it between this year and that year. So the years that we used inconsistent, you know, standards for reporting that were very different from previous years. And we counted these whole set of cases that weren't previously counted and weren't later counted. Or, yeah, we changed the definition of what counts as a kindergartner in, the, in our state, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, remember, I'd stayed up all night trying to calibrate it, and hadn't, hadn't worked. And, and they said, oh yeah, that's, oh, that's, that's of course to be expected because we changed the definition for kindergarten to include nursery school as well, or something, something weird like that. And, and so the statistics change. And so that's, you know, that's just the weirdness of, of the data source is just because of inconsist inconsistent standards. And, and the level of um, relief approaches elation in some of those cases, um, because it just doesn't seem to add up. The world doesn't make sense. You know, the different pieces of the elephant just don't seem to be connected. And suddenly you realize, oh, you've got two elephants here. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Um, I can understand this better. So calibration is an opportunity to discover. It's an opportunity to discover better theories, an opportunity to discover better parameter values. It's an opportunity to discover more about the data. But this doesn't always come in big pieces. It doesn't always come with those giant insights. It also, what it teaches you is to think like the model. Now that, that sounds perhaps strange, um, but, Remember, remember my comments that system dynamics aspires to change people's mental model. Aspires us to think more savvily about a problem, to understand more deeply, more viscerally, perhaps, more intuitively, the dynamics of the system. And when you go and calibrate, often the challenges you encounter to, to really overcome them to find how to make the model adequately account for, whether it's by modifying structure, modifying parameter values, or, or just you know, getting it to behave really well. Going through that exercise often gets you to really think like the model. So when you see data from then on from the world, you can often see what that implies about the underlying, the underlying factors in the model. You can often rock it in a deeper way. Um, so, so calibration is one of those processes that I think is too often viewed as a speed bump, and it's really a gold mine. It's really a gold mine for me. Okay. 
some initial comments on calibration. Um, okay, so let's let's talk though about this because there's a philosophical part to it. It's a conceptual part. There's a mechanical part, part of implementing it. And I want to talk about all three, if I may. Okay, so let's go um, dive into some conceptual sides. I said this morning that you know when it comes to aligning our models with data in automated or semi-automated fashion, we really have two broad sets and excuse me, I need to swivel the um, oh my forever doomed to tilt this the wrong way. So we're dealing with um, two broad sets of methods. Some come up with estimates for parameters that will allow the model to best match the data. Others allow us to, to take a stochastic system and understand What's probably going on now, given its range of variability, what particular situation are we in right now? What's this situation? How many undiagnosed diabetics are there? You know, um, how many people who have prediabetes we don't know about? Um, uh, we can kind of peer into the system and estimate these things using these methods. Um, and there are methods that combine those. But we're talking about calibration, which is in many ways by far the most common and simplest of these methods, calibration. It's also extremely valuable and, cal and, and, and um, powerful. So let's, let's talk about uh, that if we could. So um, I'm gonna shift back here. Um, okay. Um, so calibration, is a process of tuning our model assumptions and most commonly parameters to best match the, the observed data. Um, the data can be a grab bag of different things. And commonly with agent-based models, it's of all different sorts. All different sorts. More so than like with a system dynamics model where I've done extensive calibration, but you know, there, you don't have patterns over space that you're trying to match typically. You don't have, you know, information on network structure, like, like the number of contacts found through contact tracing for, for individuals or something like that. You're not, you're not able to make use of that because you're dealing with big boxing gloves that can't pick up many things. And so you deal with big screws. But with agent-based models, we can deal with screws of whatever size we want, whatever context nested context, neighborhood level data, household level data, data from a city or what have you. We, we have lots of freedom. And so we're often trying to match many, and it could be, I say time series, but this is, this is that, that should be excised that, out, out, black spot. That, just, just ignore that time series. It's not necessarily time series. Sometimes they're given to you, but it could be all sorts of things. And the idea is to get, the calibrating software to answer the question, and sometimes it's done by hand, what must our assumptions be in parameters as an example to explain all these different sources of data that I see, to accord with them at some level, at some level be consistent. Now that doesn't necessarily mean point matching, the matching them exactly at each time, but it, it means capturing their, uh, the, the, their essentials. Um, Sometimes we match against things like um, the cumulative number over a period of time instead of the details of when it was high or when it was low, or we match against it being an upwards trend, or we match it against having uh, oscillation. Um, we match against and Wade's it's, uh, autocorrelation function undertaken in the observed data. Um, a hydrological model of great significance. Would, would fail if, if it would be on a fool's errand if we tried to match the exact timing of every wave on the South Saskatchewan River. 
maybe the best hydrological model in the world, but it's, it's pointless to try to predict the exact time each wave goes up and down. I mean, there's no real significant, but we might want to capture, you know, um, some broad features of when flooding occurs or when, you know, the wave heights and or different wind conditions under the bridge or, or what have you. Um, so the point is we may, broad, we may match broad features and agent-based modeling lets us be quite flexible in terms of this. Um, uh, and, you know, frequently we'll learn importantly from this process. Okay. Um, so maybe someone could um, watch out for the chat as well. I'm gonna try to, uh, but I'm feeling in a peripatetic mode. I'm here in my bare pit, and I don't know if I'll be, you know, watching the chat quite as often. Um, Jeff McDonald was so glad the first time I, I, I stepped down under. He, he had me a bear pit. He said, "I've got a bear pit for you," in which you were watching, and I explored it well. Um, so, calibration helps us find these reasonable specifics for our gun impact. It helps us large leverage large amounts of data, data that can't go into any one parameter. We can match, we can match it with, with calibration. And it helps us challenge our models, falsify them, improve them, refine them. Okay. Um, so how does it go about this? We're, we're moving from the philosophical to the conceptual. How does it go about it? Calibration at its most basic level typically involves using an optimization algorithm. This is an algorithm to start somewhere and try to find better and better matches. Trying to adjust, if, if you're dealing with parameter uncertainty, parameters so that the model matches the salient features that we have identified from broad sets of data we bring to the table. Um, the data is often in the form of time series, but by no means always. It may be in the form of broad regularities. Again, things like women's rates tend to be much higher than men's, or you know, those over 50 tend to have you know, lengths of stay much longer than those under 50, or something like that. Um, you, you can use that sort of information. And sometimes that can be gathered from stakeholders. Um, the optimization algorithm runs this model many, many times, adjusting the assumptions in the model. And it does so in a way that homes in or hones down the model's assumptions to get a closer and closer model. That's the hope, that's the goal. That's what global optimization tries. It tries to get better and better. It's like it starts in the most sort of simplistic analogy. I'll just show you how to. No real smooth surfaces here. Um, uh, so, you know, it'll be as if, you know, we're, we're starting, um, we're starting up something like this, and it's starting up here at the. Can, you, can I see that? Or hold on. Um, yeah, they can. Okay, cool. I can see at least parts of it. So you're starting up here, and you're getting, you have a really bad map. There's a big discrepancy between what the model is producing for your salient features you're trying to match and what the corresponding data from the world sees. There's a large value of the discrepancy function. Okay, and we're going to try to lessen that value. We're gonna to try to make them closer, bring them closer. You may ask how's the discrepancy computed and I could you know, spew out various factoids, but the basic deal is it, it measures how different they are. You could think of it as the sum of squared differences or something like that. You wouldn't do that, you know, that starting point. Um, that's, that's actually a very commonly used one. So you start with a big discrepancy, and then you try to adjust parameter values. And we're in parameter space. So like going this way is changing one parameter. Going this way is changing another. Um, and as we change them, we find, oh, by, by just 
you know, increasing this parameter, this parameter and increasing that parameter um, this way, I can go down further, go down further. And then it comes down to this and it's trying to find its way down and it may get stuck in a little bit and then it finds this and it's kind of casting around on the seat of the chair for a while, trying to get better, not finding anything much better. And then it finds the edge of the chair and then it goes way down and it better and it gets to a really good match and then it can't get any better than before. Okay. Um, so that's the general idea. It's optimizing in the sense it's working to reduce the different, the discrepancy, the, the error function of the objective function. It's trying to minimize this, the disparate nature of, of these two, to adjust assumptions in the model so that the outcome of the model best matches the data. Um, and typically involves many types of, of data different data from this underlying system. Ladies and gentlemen, I spoke with you from this floor on Monday about the perspective of systems, the perspective of dynamic modeling by extension. With dynamic modeling, we're concerned about the data generating process that gives rise to data. Data in the world, different facets of faces of a common underlying system, much as those blind men and the elephant groping around the tail, the left ear, the right ear, the, the, the left leg, and indeed the trunk are different facets of the elephant. We're trying to understand the elephant. We recognize that there is some connection between these. These are not solitude. And so it is with our perspective, you know, on, on dynamical systems. And when we're engaged in calibration, we're dealing with multiple measurements from this elephant. And we're trying to figure out how to put that puzzle together so it all jives, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, some of my students have picked up my terminology here, and, <laughs> but with an unfortunate twist. Um, and I, I need to disabuse them of that. But um, instead of saying that it jives, they say it jives. And, and jive, jiving is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make a jive, like match it up really well. Jiving would be if it, you know, engaged in hip hop or something. Um, but um, here we're trying to make the model output align with observations in the world as close as possible. Um, and we're trying to find a theory of the world in its particulars that makes all these observations in the world make sense that it says, oh, of course, it's just like that. That's where we must be on the map because we see these five mountains around us in this sort of way. It all makes sense. That's the idea. Um, and the optimization is tuning um, uh, and trying to find this consistent theory by adjusting parameter values. So we're operating here in parameter space, the space where you know, we, we have different model assumptions with respect to parameter beta and mu and tau. Um, and, and at different points of parameter space, the model will behave differently. We have different values of the parameter. It will output different outcomes, right? Um, if we assume the infectious period is very long, it will tend to output you know, a situation where Early on, people infect many, many people, and the infection rises really quickly, but then it will crest quickly and perhaps come down, et cetera. And as we change aspects of the content rate or, or whatever it is, we'll, we'll, the model outputs will change. So we're operating in a space defined by the parameters. That's what I was trying to illustrate here, the direction of where I was going. And at each point in this space, the model has a certain goodness of fit to the data. I'm glossing over this. Come back to it. Certain goodness of fit. That's the idea, right? Like you run it and, and you get some output and you compare it against the empirical data and you see a discrepancy. So each point in the space, we could assign a, a point, a, a value to that indicates the discrepancy. And we're trying to find the best discrepancy, the one that the one that that is the least discrepancy. Make sense? I was applying that. 
stochastic flow. We'll come to it, right? Um, okay. Um, so we need some way of quantifying this goodness of fit, right? We have to have some discrepancy function. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but really you want a discrepancy function that's savvy, or at least not naive. Commonly matching several types of data. Not always, not invariably, but commonly we're matching different parts of the elephant. Um, so maybe we'll be matching number of new cases, number of 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 uh, of occurrences of uh, overdose deaths, or drug toxicity deaths. Maybe it's um, number of emergency room presentations for for uh, uh, overdose or near overdose. Maybe we're matching up the number of, um, of of cases of individuals who are who are using supervised injection sites, or number of individuals who are engaged in um, in, in subscription to the methadone program. Maybe those are different aspects of this underlying system that that we're trying to see, or number of individuals presenting for treatment through provincial addictions medicine mechanism. So we have data on these things, we're trying to adjust them. And what we don't wanna do is just add up the discrepancy for, case, for overdose cases to the discrepancy for emergency room presentations, the discrepancy for the other, because there are different sizes, there are different magnitudes of it. And we don't, we don't wanna just privilege the one that has the biggest magnitude, or the, you know, say a discrepancy is big, it's just because it's big numbers. We don't wanna really do a bad job with the smaller ones and, and just say, we put all our eggs in the basket so the big numbers are similar for, for one of them and ignore the other. We want it to be dimensionless. In other words, we want it, we wanna be able to add discrepancies together um, in, a, in a nice way. So often we deal with proportional discrepancies, like what, how far off is it in a proportional sense? You know, is it twice the, the empirical data? Is it 50% more of the empirical data? 75% of the empirical data we take them into account. Often it's weighted, so we, we may care about some of them more than others. The purpose of the model might allow us to weight it. We really wanna capture features of deaths and near overdoses in the, in the, in the emergency room, um, but we're, we're not as particular about capturing the, um, you know, the participation in, um, in supervised injection sites or, or, or in uh, support groups or, or what have you. Um, uh, so we, we often will wait it. Um, there's some mathematical features. We, we kind of like it so that two small discrepancies are considered in, in across two of them are considered better than one big discrepancy for one and then zero for the other. We kind of want it to, to do a pretty good match job matching all of them at some level. Spread out its difficulties instead of just saying, this one is crap. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna not care about it. Often, often that's the case. And kind of there's a set of other features here that are 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 kind of mathematical nice property. It shouldn't be infinite for some values and so on because we won't know how to find our way down from infinity. Um, this is one we use a lot. We, we take the historic minus the model one over the average of the two and then we square that and we weight it. And then we sum this up for different ones. So you might have this for, for the historic and model value for you know, if you have multiple observations over time, you might do that over time and, and kind of have them up in those weight is specific for the type of, of data that you're dealing with. Um, but uh, the point is this quantity that's being squared um, here is a dimensionless quantity. And so if you have observations for cases, on the one hand, and then also, uh, that separately observations for hospitalizations on the other, and cases are a hundred times as large as hospitalizations. You're you're dealing with proportional discrepancies, um, and the fact that that 
that uh, H, you're taking the average here means that the denominator is only really, really small if the numerator is smaller, which is, is, is quite, uh, quite a nice feature. So this is one we use. Um, there's some other ones Wade could, Wade could talk with you and, and we have public papers where we, where we characterize these things. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm, I, I don't have to beat this point, but um, calibration may seem in a certain level like regression, right? like a fancy nonlinear regression. Like we're adjusting our parameters for it to best match. The difference often, typically, the most obvious difference is typically that in a regression equation, exponential regression, logistic regression, log-based regression, linear regression, you know the form that you're trying to fit. You know, you're fitting a line or you're fitting a, you know, a, a logit function or what have you. You're, you know that, that it's fitting this uh, against it. You know the exact form. In a dynamic model, your form is emergent. <laughs> like that results from the model. And so you can't pre-specify the form of it. You can't write out a formula of what the model's behavior is over time as a function of its parameters. Instead, it emerges from it. So you have to run the model again and again and again and again to see what its value is for different, uh, different values of parameters. I don't know if that's helpful, but, but sometimes people get caught up. Another thing is you're, you're calibrating against often many different types of data at once. Um, you know, you can have multivariable as well as multivariate regression and, and so on. I mean, it's not, not impossible, but generally with, with calibration, we're really matching many things. Um, or, or often we, we, we match several things. So, um, you know, a, a sort of simplistic global optimization algorithm is it starts in a random position and then you adjust model parameters and, and you run the model and record the error function. You keep on, you keep on trying to step in a direction that will most minimize it. It's called gradient descent. By the way, it's also used for deep learning. And, and, and AI methods very, very strong. And you keep on improving until it reaches, you know, uh, a local minimum. But the problem is it can get stuck in local minima. Like it can, it can get stuck on the seat here. Um, uh, or, or like if it went inside this, it would just get stuck and think, this is the best possible world I can be in. And in fact, you want to kind of get it out of its comfort zone and Try exploring a little bit more broadly, so suddenly it will it will find this drop off as possible. So, so there's some logic to this, but the truth is you don't have to write this. You you use an algorithm, but just knowing something about what it's doing. Oh, maybe. Uh, okay, great. It, it's it's useful to know what it's doing. Hmm? Um, okay, so let's. So we went from the philosophical to the conceptual. Woven a bit of philosophy there too. But now from the conceptual, we're going to be talking about the, the practical, the, the, the implementation. So, um, let's go to that same model. Let us repair to that same model, which we used prior to lunch. And we'll be looking predominantly, since we're familiar with the model, we can dive in directly to look at the, at the scenario, the experiment. Um, we haven't really examined thus far, which is one labeled calibration. Okay, so let's go go over to that to said model, and I'm going to remove. You may recall in the final bit of our session, I added a remember this. I added a um, a waning of immunity. Remember that. I'm going to delete that. Gone. Okay. Um. And otherwise, I think this is the same as, as what it was previously. Okay, uh, it's, it's distorted, but, but not in a way that affects it, its function. Um, I can prettify it. Okay. Um, okay, so we have this model and, and you'll recall it. And we've thus far for sensitivity analysis, where we're seeing how model outcomes depend on model assumption. Um, we were using this experiment or scenario. Now we're going to calibration. Okay. Now um, I need to orient you with respect to this even more so than I did with um, uh, for the 
um, for the calibration, or sorry, for the sensitivity analysis exercise. So what's going to go on here is that we're going to have, I'm double clicking on main. I went down main. And here I have um, three panels of significance. Um, the lower right panel is probably the one you're going to, in which you want to, to which you want to pay the most attention. And it's going to depict three things. It's going to depict in yellow, and you can kind of ignore what's shown here. It's just placeholder stuff at the moment. Historic data. So that's empirical data from the world. And, and for simplicity, we're just going to be matching one type of data, uh, but a time series of said data. Yeah, it's going to be yellow. The current output from the model, the current output from the model, for the current set of parameters, remember we're we're modifying parameters in, in, in parameter space. We're trying to find the best set of parameters. The results for those set of parameters are going to be shown in blue. But again, I'm going to nuance that by saying, remember, we're dealing with a model that's stochastic. So that means for a given set of parameters, we may have variability, right? Between what we see for one run and what we see for another. True or not? Mm. So the current output is actually going to be with the current set of parameters. That much is true. But also with the current vagaries of stochastic. And then we're going to have a best output, which is kind of the, the output from the best parameter match thus far. Um, and I think it's going to pick a random realization. It's not going to pick a quibble. Wade, Wade may be able to say um, here. Uh, Wade, you recall for the red, um, uh, I think it may just be showing one realization for the best parameter set without trying to average them. The most recent one. Okay, for, for, the, for the one that best matched on average. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what's going to be shown here, okay? And, and then up above, we're going to have an illustration of calibration progress. And progress here is going to be measured in terms of securing better, smaller and smaller discrepancies, making progress to matching the data better and better. And that means less and less discrepancy between what the model says and what the empirical data says. Hmm? Hmm. And so what's shown in the x-axis here is going to be successive calibrate, sort of steps of calibration or iterations of calibration is the watch word. And for each of them, we're going to have a particular set of parameters on them. And for said parameters, parameter assumptions, we'll be running the model and running it again according to a number of replications. Remember that concept from this morning where we run the model many times, maybe it's 10 times, maybe it's 30 times. Um, we run it really again and again, and we take the average of how well it matches across those realizations. Take the average of the discrepancy. We're going to plot that out here. Um, as, as we go further and further. Hopefully, we're choosing more and better and better values. We're exploring and we're finding better and better values that will get us to a better and better minimum thus far. And we're going to be plotting out what's, what's the best one we've gotten to. Actually, I'm sorry, here it actually is going to try some that are not so good. It's trying out some that actually, you know, it, it takes a lark and, and tries something out that's not so good. So maybe it's stuck at the bottom of my upside down helmet. And then it, it's going to try rising and, and get something that's worse. That's not necessarily a bad thing because by so doing, it may escape the helmet and then go down further and then be able to go down further. So You'll see some that kind of go up there. It's not showing the best so far. It's showing, showing the current, current one. But by and large, it gets better. In the upper left, you're going to actually see the parameters found here. So this is the, this is the picture. Um, can we try it? OK. okay let, me, let me reorient the, uh, the projector so they can. Um, they will not escape my visage. Um, OK, so here we go. So I'm going to run this calibration. 
and I'm running it, and we're going to press this this run button. Here's the historic data. That's the that's the yellow. Okay, and it's going to be running, and it's slow. And I'm wondering if it needs more memory. Memory? Is it a memory issue, Wade? I think it very likely is. Oh, no, not, not for me right now. Okay. Oh, yes, there it is. There it is. It, it um, Wade's, oh, I thought I changed this. Oh, it was, I changed the other experiment. Good call. Remember, um, remember I changed this before, memory? Do you remember that from this morning? But it's a good lesson. The memory is not for the model as a whole. The memory is for the experiment. And so I changed it for the other experiment because it was causing similar, it was exhibiting computational distress. Remember that? It, it also wasn't running. So I changed it to a larger value. And now I'm just changing this in the same way. I'm giving it a gigabyte. Wade was more generous and provided it with considerable largesse. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to run this now. And hopefully with, with better memory, it will be well accoutred and it will run quickly. And there we go. Oh, look at that, look at that. You see the action taking place here? Look at that. So here is the historic data. It's trying to match. This is the best output it's found thus far. Not very great, right? I mean, it has a peak early and, and goes down, but the peak is too early, right? It goes down at roughly the right rate, but it's, it's not very good at matching the timing of the climb up, et cetera. But you notice it's getting better. This is, it's, it's sort of got something that's gone down from about, you know, uh, 1575 down to like close to 1500. Are we ready to continue to run it? Watch this. Trying, trying, trying. Oh, look, it found something. Oh, it's getting close. It's getting close. And look, it's down to 800, right? Getting close. Um, you notice some of the realizations. I think it's showing every realization here. So the blue are showing successive realizations, some of, of which there are several for each parameter value. If we go look at this and we do replications, we will find five replications per parameter value right there. Use replication five for this calibration experiment. So each parameter value, it's picking, trying to get down here to really evaluate it robustly, to make sure it's not a fluke. It runs it many times, runs it five times right now. And it takes their average. So it's, and it's showing you know the latest one, which is subject to, to chance as well. So some of those get really, really close, but they're just one realization among a, a whole ensemble for that set of parameter values, for a given set of parameter values. But look where it's gotten to. Look where it's arrived at. You can see it's gotten down, gosh, to like 100 or something like that. It's getting really close to this. And it's doing so by adjusting the parameter values. Here are the parameter values right here. Um, and uh, it is trying to match it as best it, it, it can. This shows the, sort of the best one thus far. Um, so here, ladies and gentlemen, you could see it trying some. It's, you know, keeps on trying others. Some of them are pretty darn competitive, but some of them are like way off, as badly off as the first one. And it's trying to learn from it. So calibration, in, in the approach it's using taboo search, which is a, a well characterized calibration algorithm. This is running what's called the, the OptQuest calibration engine, which is a popular industrial global optimization algorithm. It's, it's optimizing um, in a way that is learning over time from what works, what doesn't work. I think it actually combines, if it worked really well for this one and then really well for a very different one, it tries to do combinations of them at some level, kind of find something, learning from both that will be also pretty good, et cetera. It's not, 
It's not just finding the best one so far and just resting on that laurel. It's, it's actually trying to consciously sort of find, find better matches. So you could run this for a while. And indeed, this calibration is going to run for 500 iterations. Um, each iteration is running it five times. Um, and you can see it's gotten pretty darn close, pretty darn close to the single type of data that's in. Okay. Uh, so this is an example of calibration in action. Now, I think I would do to you a disservice if I didn't talk a little bit about how this is really, okay? This, this shows it in action, but what's really going on? How do you make this happen? How do you achieve this sort of um, calibration? Um, so I wanna walk you through that quickly. Time is of the essence, and we have other ground to cover this afternoon, but I wanna impart you with, with some understanding here. Okay, so first of all, this is a calibration experiment. So this type of experiment, in any logic that's called the calibration experiment. Um, uh, but there's also a type called an optimization experiment, which you can use for calibration very readily as well. And I think this is actually um, a, uh, a, a calibration, uh, an optimization experiment. It's adjusting parameter values. Um, I think a calibration experiment has some additional Features, but maybe Wade can can comment. Maybe calibration is a type of optimization. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't. Very good, yeah. And NARGES over here has used reinforcement learning, uh, although I'm not sure the degree to which that currently is the case. But, uh, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. How is the objective function determined? Um, well, I commented on, you know, nice features of an objective function. Um, objective functions are, standard sort of quantities when you try to optimize something. And basically it needs to have some nice properties and I've listed them here. Um, there are, uh, I've, I've given some rules of thumb and, and generally there's no canonical objective function. You can choose one that captures a, a discrepancy um, that you're satisfied with. And, for the most part, we use something along these lines. We have used some that are based on kind of inspired by Bayesian likelihoods. Um, um, and those, those are also um, options. Like, there's no hard and fast rule about that. Uh, you'll find people formulating objective functions that describe how well does A match B, you know, of, of many different sorts. And I don't think it's, um, you know, you, you want something with that's thoughtful, like I've described here, but it's not a, um, it's not like there's one, only one way to do it, nor is there, um, uh, nor is there a, you know, consensus within health modeling by any means for this. It's um, something that you want to, want to pick some properties, and I've picked, I've noted what I consider the most important properties on this very set. So I'd say it's picked. And my strong recommendation would be to use one that has characteristics such as those. I believe that's helpful. Um, many of the iterations says infeasible. Yeah. So, um, so this is a, it's a good question. And I noticed that, that flashing. And I'm going to make my uh, remarks on this. And again, Wade in his wisdom beyond his years will may be able to, to further comment on this. So in calibration, um, 
we will sometimes wish to enforce certain invariants or constraints. Um, and these generally fall into two types, each of which is separately handled in any logic. So within any logics, calibration or optimization, you'll notice that there are two expando windows um, here, one called constraints and one called requirements, okay? And these deal with different sorts of invariants you want to maintain, um, different in the sense that some come in your parameters, that's the constraints, and then some are requirements. They're evaluating whether the solution is adequate. Um, so I'll comment on the first. Um, there are times where, for example, you want to draw parameter values um, from some range, but you have some logical constraints, like they can't sum up to more than one something like that. It's not a constraint involving a specific parameter alone. That's a constraint involving several. Each parameter here um, is actually specified. I, I probably should have shown this. It's specified as lying in a certain range. It's varying it within this range. So if we think back to, to this, it's as if the bounds of this box had certain values as indicated by this minimum and this maximum um, uh, there. And you know this one is a certain bounding and this one is a certain bounding. It's exploring within that range. Okay, now um, this bounds each of them, but maybe sometimes there's some constraint you want to impose that is a combination. Of, again, the sum, something about their product. It can't be, product can't be too big, et cetera. Um, you can capture that in constraint. So basically, it will check if the parameters that are being used are suitable as a whole that goes beyond you know, the value of any one parameter. Um, so you can have an expression that's, that's fine and, and say it has to live in some bounds. And if it comes up with parameter values that are outside those rules, it will it will say, I'm not going to run this. That's not worth examining. An example might be also if a parameter goes negative, right? Maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense for negative or the sum of them to be negative or whatever. Um, requirements um, are tested in a way that you're evaluating whether the results make sense, whether they are you know, whether they're sensible, whether they're meaningful. Um, and here, sometimes you have emergent behavior where you want to maintain certain um, basic features of the situation. Maybe it's some historical situation. Um, maybe it's something about the numerical stability, so you don't want it to go negative or something. Um, maybe. You never want it for plausibility to have a peak above a certain level. Some of these things you could build into the objective function, the discrepancy function. But for many of them, you well, for some of them, you might find it easier to just toss things out that don't match a certain level of quality. Um, and um, that is something which can be done in requirements. Um, you could try to do it in objective function, but there are times like where, like if something goes negative, you want to say it's like, this is like infinitely bad or something like that. It's, it's like bad, bad, bad. I don't want to consider this at all. I don't want to learn from this. I basically throw this away. It's not, it's not adequate. It's, it's in, you know, it's improper uh, results. And these things come up quite a bit. actually. Um, um, even some things like women, you know, it should be higher in women than men. You might want to throw away things where women, men have a, uh, you know, have a higher value than women for it. Um, 
because you know that they're they're not acceptable. Um, so you can you can use this to toss away values um, that are not uh, not adequate. Now, as to why it was flashing in this way, saying infeasible, infeasible. Um, uh, you know, I I actually didn't remember that, and uh, I'll ask Wade if if uh, he has any thoughts or if he could look into it because right now I was thinking it might be one of these requirements, but I don't see it. But Wade may have a sage comment. Ah. Ah, okay. Okay. Right. Got it. Yeah, so it's not indicating some sort of deep flaw about the assumptions or some problematic model behavior what this is actually, when it's updating this in the upper left, it, it is basically indicating it's not ready yet to give a value for current here because the replications, the five of them that are required per the, the replications elements here haven't yet completed. So it's saying, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. You know, don't, don't hurry me. I'm not ready yet. Um, you know, I'll tell you in, in, in the fullness of time. Um, and so it's going to say infeasible, infeasible, feasible for this current until finally it finishes the last one of those five. And then it will say, okay, boom. you know, this is, this, is the, um, this is the current objective function uh, here. And then it will start doing it again and again. And again. So if we run that again, here we go. Um, uh, okay. Um, and you will probably see it saying replication two, three. And by the way, it may be doing these out of order as well, I think. So if your computer has a bunch of cores, it may be running things for a later iteration at the same time as it's doing it for the current iteration. It may be really savvy about using your computer to its fullest speculatively, like as to what, you know, what, what to, um, uh, you know, if, if this turns out to be really good, you know, this is where I'd go next. If this turns out to be bad, I'd go next there, or what have you, and it's, it's running some for that. So I think this, this is kind of a bookkeeping infeasible, not a, not a deep infeasible. But the truth is, um, this notion of feasibility comes up very squarely when it comes to um, the, uh, the requirements. And I will tell you that Kurt Kruger, who will speak with us shortly, um, is makes use of in running the current iteration of the COVID-19 model, originally architected by Wade and built by Wade and you know, managed by Wade for, for six months and then supported by Wade to some degree after that as well. Um, uh, that these days. There's a fair bit of pruning of the runs based on fidelity to historic data. Um, but I think that comes in particularly at the running phase, running calibration, sort of the results of calibration. Um, uh, so, so I'm gonna make a comment, okay? Um, when you're calibrating, you're calibrating to historic data. Hmm? Um, and you're trying to find the best set of parameters, the one that here on average match the observed data as, as well as possible. By I say on average, because you get, if you run it once, twice, three times, you get somewhat different results, right? And you look at the one on average. Okay. Um, but bear in mind that when we're evaluating, um, we, we find the best set of parameters, the one that has the best average. And then we run it for that, over that historic period where we, for which we calibrate it. 
we can't assume that it's going to be a really good map because we'll get a different realization, not tough, well, of different vagueness. So what Kurt does, I think a fair bit is trim off, like he'll run it historically over that period to which it's calibrated. And the ones that don't accord with that data, at least fairly well get thrown away, thrown away, thrown away, thrown away. So that, you know, it matches very well over that data period. Um, uh, and it's calibrated, of course. And then he, and, and, you know, he could probably comment on that more because I think this is like in his bones. And uh, he's he's uh, you know, exceptional in his capability. Um, okay, um, so just some thoughts. There. Um, okay, so so let's let's try to explore this uh, some more. Um, so uh, this is a calibration experiment, and it's set up to define a objective function. This is actually a built-in difference. Is a is a built-in function of any logic that will take the sum squared differences. Maybe you'll take the square root as well. And, um, and it's comparing one data set versus another. Remember we learned about data sets? So it actually has read in the historic data into a data set. You'll find other videos of me explaining where this is. By the way, I did control and I clicked on it and it brought me to the data set. When this model starts running, it reads, basically it reads the data in this, what's called the table function. Looks like this, if that looks familiar with good reason. And it puts it in this data set, okay? In this BS infectious historic. That's what it does when it starts. And you can actually see it right down here. Um, uh, it, you could see it, it fills up this data set with, data from this, this function here. And then before each experiment run, it sort of, before the run of the whole experiment, it resets all its judgment about what's the best set of parameters. And then it's running it and it's running each realization. And after each realization, it reads out the data on the number of people infectious over time and squirrels it away. And then basically it, um, if this is the best, best match in terms of, of this um, difference function, it, it, it basically fills up um, the best one so it can display it uh, right here. And that's, that's the blue one, I think that shown. Um, so it'll, it'll show the latest. Um, and, after each simulation run, it's computing this objective function. And once it finishes all the replication for a given iteration, given set of parameter values, it averages them um, to, to compare how good they are with others. And, um, and, and that's, that's done uh, in association with the OptQuest uh, engine and, and then then it can figure out, hey, you know, is this current iteration the best one thus far? Um, that's kind of the, the, the gist of what's going on. And you can find me explaining this in much more detail and even setting up, I think, uh, experiments. Um, this is how it takes place in any way. And it's running the model many times, just like sensitivity analysis ran it many times. But the goal here is to arrive at a set of parameter values, in this case, a set of model assumptions which allow it to best match the data. And you can imagine that that match is contingent, not only upon the parameter values, but also upon model structure. So if we were to look at this and we were to go to person, for example, and we were to add in a change, um, you would find it would have a very hard time matching it. So once again, if we were to go add in here, um, a Glucksmanian uh, transition here. Um, uh, so it's going from uh, recovery to susceptible. Um, and I'm going to make it a timeout transition with a time of year one divided by 0 0.03. This is what we did earlier this morning. So it's a timeout transition. Remember that? 
Remember what sort of behavior this induced? Does anyone remember what sort of behavior to which it gave rise? Sorry? Waves indeed, waves. And so let's, let's go run this, okay? And let's try to calibrate it. How do you think it's gonna do calibrating? Here it is, this is the historic data, a lofty goal. Now it's trying to run this. Oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's trying, <laughs> it's trying. Okay, it, it's, it's the best so far is not that great. It's up around 1700, right, still. Now, it's trying to learn, it's trying to learn. It's, the little engine is trying, um, but you can see there's actually a variety of different outcomes, but it's really not that great. It's finding a bunch that are, you know, that are around the same level, but it's just, just can't match out here, right? It can match okay back here, but it's, it's in trouble, you know, it's, it's really flailing around, right? It's, it's just not matching it adequately. And this is a sign that we might wanna rethink our assumptions in the structure because it just doesn't add up to be consistent with the observed data. It just doesn't jive with the observed data. It just doesn't align with it, it's not consistent with it. Um, and, the calibration forces us to kind of square with the fact that even if we adjust parameter values over pretty wide ranges, we're not going to not going to be able to um, to get it to match very well. Um, so um, here, um, uh, you know, we have a lot of so I provide a lot of details of, of some of the specifics here. Um, but um, you know, I I should note that there's this distinction between the experiment and the the simulation um, uh, and a given replication. I think actually simulation here is referring to particular realization uh, or replication here. Um, so so even though this says simulation scenario, we're we're dealing here with a scenario with many particular runs. Um, Right, um, and there are some uh, some mechanisms for trying to pick in an automatic savvy way the number of replications we need. So it won't if it doesn't need many replications because the data is not highly variable. It it will use fewer, and otherwise it will use more. Um, and I I go through kind of the reasoning about that. So basically. It, it's going to try to run enough so the confidence interval for the mean lies within a certain percent of of the um, of the 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 sample the sample mean. Um, um, you, you you could see you want a, conf a certain confidence level, and um, you need it to 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 lie within a certain error error percent. The confidence interval falls within a certain error percentage. Around the, uh, the the sample mean. Um, okay. Um, uh, right. Um, so I do want to say that look, um, a couple broad features. First of all, it is running it for each replication or each realization, so you can observe that. And you know, this is kind of the the most less least textured of of these. Um, uh, it's, um, you know, often we have mul multiple things we're trying to match at once. And we, we would there add these parameter values together, add them together in a weighted way. But we would take the, we wouldn't just take the difference, we would normalize it so that we, we aren't just, again, favoring the thing that's largest and where the discrepancies are in an absolute sense, the largest. So a couple considerations. If your model is having trouble um, finding a unique set of parameters that create a good result, 
um, you can add in more data and that constrains the interpretation. You add in more evidence and it gives the model more reason to pick one set of parameters compared to another, more evidence for choosing parameter values. Um, adding parameters to tune, you add, you say, you know, match, match me these 10 parameters. It's gonna have a really large space to explore. It's kind of like exploring along a line versus exploring in a, so, so along a line would be one parameter. I'm analogizing that to one, one parameter. All it has to do is search for the best value of that one parameter, just it has to search, say, within a given fixed range as specified by you, as specified over here. Um, uh, um, right, right here, specified in this range. Min and max. One parameter, you're just searching along a line. You're trying to find that. Two parameters, you're searching a rectangle. You've got one parameter here, and you've got one parameter here, and you're trying to find the best place here where the discrepancy is the least. Mm -hmm. Trying to find the one where it's most the sweet spot got the best value of this parameter and the best value of this parameter. Um, and if you have three parameters, it's exploring a volume and space. It's like, you know, it's like a parallel pipette or, or, or a cube or, or what have you, sort of like that one I had on that slide, right? So you've got one parameter dimension here, one along here, one along here, and you're trying to find a point in the space that's associated with um, the minimum parameter value inside of here. You're exploring around in there. If you have four, you like you've got this in time, over time, you know. Um, and the more parameters you have, the bigger the volume you're exploring. It grows geometrically. It gets very large. So just be aware that you know you're setting setting up for a bigger challenge. And um, you know, realistically, um, you know, I've heard of successful parameterizations, which have, you know, 10 parameters um, or more, but, you know, you, you really need a lot of data. You really need a lot of data. Um, Agent-based models help that because you can compare a lot of things in the model against their comparable data in the world. If you have an aggregate model, it's hard to compute certain things in the model that compare directly with things. And so you're, you're at greater disadvantage. Um, um, it, it is possible, this is pretty advanced, but if anyone out there is looking for more advanced topics, it is possible to reduce the number of parameters for your model through de-dimensionalization of your model. It's a rather nice trick. Um, you can reduce the number of things you have to calibrate or have to do sensitivity analysis on in a very, very nice way. Um, uh, and that can be helpful if you, if you want to try to reduce by two or three the number of parameters. Um, um, so I argued from this floor this morning that calibration is about learning. In fact, I said that after lunch. Calibration is not a speed bump on the way to a working model. It's not a inconvenient rest stop while you, you know, get get ready for your model to do its interesting. This is our chance often to learn. It's our chance to learn about the reliability of data, the reliability of assumptions, parameters that that have to have to you know certain values to learn about the system, to learn what theory, the details of the theory that will adequately allow us to to explain simultaneously all this data we're trying to match. All these observations from the world, we want to find theory that will, theory of everything, theory that will explain all these different at once, consistent. And, and if you get in trouble, if you can't get it to adequately match, there's, there's a whole process 
that you can start to track it down scientifically. It reminds me a lot of debugging. Um, it reminds me a lot, you're, you develop hypotheses for why it's off, you try, you try to change things, you try to outsmart the calibration, you say, why is it doing such a lousy job? I think I can do better. I'm gonna pick this parameter and that parameter. And then you see what it gives and you say, oh my God, I didn't realize that's what would result. And it improves your thinking, right? Like it, it, it advances your sharpness of your thinking. So then you try to do something else. You, you say, oh, I'm better than you, I can figure it out. And, and you, you start learning how the model works. Like you start thinking like the model. You realize the model's not gonna like this because you squeeze here, it's gonna pop out there. In order to match this, it will need to, given the model logic right now, it'll need to posit this really weird thing, which won't jive with that data. So you start to, to learn to do this. So, you know, um, often I adopt the best values that it gave thus far, and then I try to adjust them, and I, I try to outsmart it, and, you know, typically I, I discovered, oh, okay, that's why it's stuck. That's why it's stuck, because it can't, it can't match X without screwing up Y. Um, uh, and, and you learn, you know, surprising. Um, uh, so sometimes, you know, often we just shift the discrepancy from one thing to the other. Um, uh, another thing you could do is set a very high weight on the thing you really want to match. And then you see what goes wrong with other things. So you, you give it, get it to put all its or most of its effort in one thing, and then you see it go to hell in a handbasket and other things. It just, you know, it can't explain these other things. And you think, oh, okay, okay, I see what's upsetting it. Yeah, yeah, how does this square? Oh, we need a more general structure for this, or we need to add a, you know, a, a state for, for latent, latently infected individuals, or we need to add some waning of immunity to account for this, this phenomenon, maybe that is going on. Okay, we should talk to other stakeholders about that. Or you say, maybe this parameter value, maybe we're really under, maybe we're really overstating the, the ascertainment rate, the fraction of people out there with diabetes that we're discussing. Maybe, maybe it's actually considerably lower than we think. Um, and you start talking with stakeholders to figure out, could this be the case? This is learning, ladies and gentlemen. The model's telling you about about inconsistencies in your thinking that you didn't previously realize. And, and you're, you're then taking action, like talking to stakeholders or looking at some other data or trying to figure out from other jurisdictions or looking at other models, how they squared with some data. And it's forcing you to think differently. It's advancing your mental model. And even if it takes you a while, success in the modeling. Yeah, Michael. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, this is a good question. So for those online, Michael said that um, he observed that in the system dynamics literature, there's a tradition of, of drawing parameter values from participants and from stakeholders within a system, for example, sometimes for structured elicitation instruments like surveys, et cetera. Um, uh, does that go on in agent-based modeling? I'd say it's less formalized there. Um, I, think, I think there are quarters definitely where it goes on, but system dynamics as a community, one of the things that it tends to have to its credit is really thinking through the process, um, the modeling process. And, and this is an example of that. Um, discrete event simulation is very serious about parameter elicitation. And they too, from industrial engineering, have thought this through. I think agent-based modeling, um, I haven't seen that sort of emphasis. And um, I think it's a missed opportunity, just like I think it's too bad they haven't traditionally emphasized participatory processes in general. Yeah. Um, um, again, this is not without exception. Um, uh, and it's not without some favor. Um, you know, I think Ross Hammond is quite interested in that. Um, 
uh, certainly I'm very interested in it. I think you'll find some other practitioners just, it, it, it tends not in terms of the social norms of the community to be that, that well emphasized. And I think it's a missed opportunity. Um, by the way, another thing you could do is set all weights, set all other weights besides, so if it's screwing up one thing, like it's not matching X, set all other weights to zero. So you put it all its eggs in that basket of X. See then, can it act to X? You know, if it doesn't have any compromises it has to do for other things. And, and if it can't, then that's a sign off and the model structure won't allow it to match it, which is interesting. Now, another sort of set of advice here is if you're having calibration problems, increase the parameter range that you're considering. Make this range larger. By the way, if someone could let people in, the doors back there are locked. I'm just wondering if we could, I see people coming by and I know several people have left. If you wanna leave it just a jar, just leave it a jar so that um, people can diffuse in if they rot. Um, you can increase the parameter range. That's what this is, right? And you might say, uh, really didn't think. You know, the ascertainment rate was realistically below 0.4, but I'll try it at 0.2 and I'll see what happens, learn from it. Maybe it does make sense. You increase the number of parameters, perhaps. Um, sometimes you end up trying combinations of parameter values. So you say, you know, okay, if, if the ascertainment rate is really low, sort of our, our, our uh, effectiveness at diagnosing people, that would posit a large number of undiagnosed people. Um, and maybe there's some, and that would suggest a higher rate of development of this condition. And you start to explore ideas like that. Um, try different model structure, see if it helps, you know, try, try some other model structure, run for a larger number of optimization runs and find other estimates. Um, uh, another thing you wanna look for is uniqueness. You know, when you run it several times with different random number seeds, do you get comparable calibration values? Or are they like way different from each other? Um, uh, and, you know, if you have very different interpretations, you can impose more constraints, you can find other estimates, reduce the number of, of parameters, collect more primary data, try to get expert judgment. By the way, there is within the Asian-based law modeling literature, quite a lot of expert judgment parameters. It's just, it's not, you know, the, the, the elicitation instruments, the sort of tradition of formally checking with people, is, that's the thing I haven't seen much. Um, much too much evidence of. I, I, I could just be ignorant of it and it's going on in some projects. I'm sure it's going on some, um, some others, but I, I just don't see it at, the, at a, as prominent a level. Um, uh, so, um, you know, also another thing to do when you calibrate and get back results, look for calibrated values that are at the edge of their range. So it really, it thinks it should be even lower. It's at the edge of its range, the low end. That's a sign that there's something it likes about it being low. And often you can learn something by letting it go lower. Um, I wish more of my students could do this. I mean, this is like, these are like my tricks of the trade. So when my students come to me with calibration things, they'll often, you know, trot, trot these things out. Um, um, yeah. Um, so this is this interdependence and so on. Okay, we, we have to, I think what we'll do is, um, by the way, you, you can calibrate initial conditions. People get tied up about initial conditions of models. Truth is, initial conditions often get washed out. And sometimes you do burn periods where you run it for a while anyway, and you get a well-mixed initial condition that's, that has kind of forgotten its initial state. Um, I tend not to worry that much about initial conditions. There are times where it's, by initial conditions, I mean, how many people start in each state. It's worth putting some effort into, but really getting, getting all tied up about it is typically not worth it because within a certain amount of time, what dictates really what's gonna go on after some, often some fairly small amount of time is the, is the rates of change. It's not the initial, um, the initial value. Okay. Okay. So unfortunately, this is all I have time for 
you know, in the normal schedule for calibration. Um, Kurt Kruger, my, my um, plan was to have some hands-on exercises now, but I think with the, the reshift, Kurt Kruger will be uh, talking unless, unless uh, Wade, there's been any update on that. Okay, great. So I think we're going to have Kurt call in. Um, so I think what we're going to do is stop this recording and why don't we take a couple minute break, just washroom break, et cetera, and reconvene here and I'll have Kurt set up, et cetera. Okay, Kurt's attending remotely and he'll probably join here in the fullness of time. So, okay, thanks.